Let me start this session. Uh, this is the session number six and the last uh, session of this international dialogue on migration. We are going to be looking now at uh, meeting funding needs for capacity development on migration. So it is, first of all, a, a pleasure to welcome all the panelists uh, here uh, and to have this discussion at the end as, uh, as we have been discussing yesterday and this morning, we have looked uh, during this IDM at several facets of capacity development, both theoretically and uh, in practical terms. And we have discussed the importance that capacity development has for all of us and for the global compact that we are going to be adopting very soon. In this last session, the we wanted to come back to what is usually the stumbling block, that is, the question of resources. Who is going to pay all this and how are we going to pay for it? Key importance of capacity development is, I think, widely recognized, and it has been repeatedly underlined in this meeting and also highlighted throughout uh, the global compact development process uh, during the negotiations, during the consultations, we know that strengthen capacity in policy, in legislation, institutions, and a variety of different technical areas in the migration sphere will be essential for the implementation of the Global Compact and has to be and is a matter of priority for everybody. In discussing this, we need to remember that contributions to capacity development are not only limited to financial contributions. The Global Compact for Migration, for instance, refers to technical and human resources in addition to financial resources. This highlights the importance of dialogue, experience sharing, and exchange as a key means to support capacity development. Most countries, including the high-income ones, have some capacity gaps. This is fortunately not something that affects only developing countries. At the, at the same time, the majority of states, including many middle and lower income countries, have good practices to share and even lessons learned from practices that may not have worked well. Mm -hmm. Similarly, non-state actors have a lot to bring to the table. So therefore, in this uh, situation, we really all have something to contribute and something to gain from working together. So how can we work together to make sure that we have the means to act on what we have all agreed that is a priority, that is this capacity development? This is, I think, the key question we are going to discuss now and hopefully find some answers for. Let me offer a, specific, some, a few specific points for your consideration before beginning, including for the panelists. One of the avenues to consider is optimizing the use of resources that have been uh, provided already to ensure maximum impact. The Global Compact on Migration can help us with this. It provides, for the first time, uh, something that we didn't have so far in the migration, migration sphere a common roadmap for how states can best manage migration and cooperate more effectively with one another as well as with other stakeholders. But we need to reflect how to ensure that the leverage, that we leverage all the existence of this, common, this new common framework to help streamlining the way priorities for capacity development are identified and the funding is channeled at different levels local, national, regional, and global. The Global Compact document provides at least part of the answer. In that compact, the governments have committed to establish a capacity building mechanism, which would include a startup fund in support of Global Compact of Migration implementation. The workings of this mechanism are still being developed, and there is much uncertainty about many aspects of it including how the startup fund will be financed. However, it holds a promise 
of a more systematized way to both bring together resources for capacity development that different stakeholders have to offer and also how to allocate them. This brings me to another key point, the importance of recognizing the contributions of different actors and facilitating their engagement going forward and the value of collaborating, of working together towards common objectives. I think that this panel discussion will be an opportunity to highlight examples of multi-partner initiatives to strengthen capacities in the migration sphere. I hope to hear examples of what is being done already and suggestions for what more can be done for greater engagement and empowerment of civil society, of the private sector, of diasporas, uh, and migrants themselves. And how can we, uh, the UN agencies, work better uh, with these key actors? What are some of the challenges that multi-stake uh, hold their collaboration has and how can they be overcome in the future. And I would encourage all of you to consider the way both, the ways both financial and non-financial contributions to capacity development can be leveraged. Finally, this question of funding and resources for capacity development is not limited, obviously, to migration. It is still being discussed, for, for instance, in the context of the 2030 Agenda implementation. Are there any lessons that we can learn uh, from, from, that, uh, from that discourse for capacity development in migration and more specifically to support the GS GCM implementation? Let me, with all this, open the discussion and give the floor to the, our panelists uh, and make a brief introduction of all of them. We have uh, a number of very uh, wise and knowledgeable uh, people uh, in, in the panel. We had uh, one more person or, or two, but uh, uh, they, they couldn't make it last minute. But fortunately, we have a lot of experience here, and I think I am always happy when I have to chair small panels, <laughs> uh, because uh, instead of running, people can indeed talk and then you will have the time to do, ask questions and have a more pro, uh, interactive uh, discussion. So uh, I would say, first of all, let me introduce Ola Henriksson. Ola is the Director General for the Department of Migration and Asylum in the Swedish Ministry of uh, Justice. Uh, we all know Ola. Uh, we have seen him uh, in several uh, cases and he's a collaborator of IOM, a very present in a lot of meetings of us. He has worked in the field of migration and asylum for over 25 years, and he is currently the head of the Swedish delegation at the Strategic Committee on Immigration Frontiers and Asylum, where he has acted as chair during the Swedish presidencies of 2001 and 2009. I'm happy to welcome here you, Ola, and to have you again. Please, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Laura, and I'm going to try and pick up on some of the questions you posed and, and the means to act, and I would like to, in particular, talk about core funding of, of IOM. Uh, so, so good afternoon, everybody. With the Global Compact on Safe, Orderly and Regular Migration, we have reached near universal consensus on the need for multilateral cooperation in the area of international migration. The implementation of GCM requires not only political will, but also strategic long-term perspective on the questions of financing. In other words, how can we ensure that GCM is not only a list of objectives and actions on a piece of papers, but that we have both the will and resources to implement these actions? Focusing on the issue of resources, I would like to highlight a few key factors. The UN Secretary General has decided to establish the UN Migration Network for the implementation of the Global Compact. IOM is placed as its secretariat and responsible for coordinating. To ensure that the network will deliver effective and coherent support for the implementation of the Global Compact, IOM, alongside other UN agencies, must have increased capacity in terms of staffing and resources. Sweden welcomes the decision to establish a capacity building mechanism at the United Nations that builds on existing initiatives and supports efforts of member states to implement the Global Compact. 
In our view, IOM should serve as a secretariat for the mechanism. Financing of projects will be essential when implementing specific actions of the Global Compact. But UN agencies, member states and other key stakeholders also need to possess long-term financial strength and stability when working towards a sustainable model for safe, regular and orderly migration. And this brings me to the key issue of core funding. Sweden, in line with the commitments made at, in the Grand Bargain, strongly believes that unearmarked or lightly earmarked core contributions lead to greater effectiveness of individual organizations as well as the system at large. Flexible funding facilities, swifter response to urgent needs, it strengthens decision-making bodies, it supports management systems and the use of cost-efficient tools. It also reduces the amount of resources spent on grant-specific administration, notably, notably procurement and reporting. It is important to point out that Sweden appreciates and wants to ensure IOM's continued role as a hands-on organization with the ability to act swiftly on the ground. That said, IOM is currently funded almost entirely by program grants, while a mere one to two percent of its budget comes from unearmarked funding. This is problematic for two reasons. First, it limits IOM in terms of issues such as resource management. Second, and perhaps more importantly, the many IOM projects implemented every year generate a wealth of knowledge that should be used to develop best practices policy in migration-related areas. However, efforts to harness such know-how from the field are hampered by the organization's lack of stable, foreseeable, and long-term funding. With this in mind, Sweden has provided IOM with some core funding during the past few years. The funding has been lightly earmarked for the purpose of strengthening core features such as administrative functions with the establishment of the UN Migration Network. This is even more important. Sweden's aim with the core funding is partly to further strengthen IOM's ability to focus on policy making. We cannot do it alone. In order to achieve this goal, I believe the balance between project-based and core finance should be more in the vicinity of 90 versus 10 percent ratio rather than 97 versus what, 1, 2, 3 percent. In this context, I would also like to highlight key, another key factor, the need to get more relevant stakeholders on board. And I think you also mentioned this in your introduction. Getting everyone on board also relates to the question of non-financial resources. The Global Compact has been achieved primarily by getting everyone to the table by dialogue and by sharing knowledge. Financial resources will of course be crucial in the implementation of the Global Compact, but so will continued networking and collaboration. It is therefore important that we make use of the current momentum in order to further strengthen the multilateral structure dealing with international migration. Collaboration should be further strengthened with so-called non-traditional actors. The Global Compact clearly points out a number of such relevant stakeholders, civil society, diaspora organizations, faith-based organizations, the private sector, trade unions, academia, to name a few. A good example of such engagement has been IOM's IRIS project, which aims at providing guidelines for ethical recruitment of international labor migrant. IRIS makes a compelling case for why employers should get involved in migration issues, both content-wise and in the terms of financing. To conclude, we have now to look forward to the high-level meeting in Marrakesh. Let us all make use of the occasion to present our intentions to support implementation of the Global Compact, be it by pledges to the Startup Fund or of the capacity building mechanism or by presenting new innovative forms of collaboration in order to advance capacity development on migration. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ola. Um, I can assure you that uh, I didn't agree with him that he was going to say all that. <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, certainly is, is something that uh, I, I think reflects very, good, very well uh, the needs that we have in IOM. And I hope that you all have taken note of it uh, and you will take decisions in, the, in that uh, regard very soon. Mm -hmm. Now let me move to uh, our, my, my next speaker, Dr. Marike Winsrooks. I hope I haven't destroyed your name. Um, she is the Chief of Staff at the Global Fund, 
uh, were uh, here from, from June 2017 uh, through uh, February 2018. She served as interim executive director. Uh, her distinguished career includes more than 30 years of experience in global health and development, serving in government at the United Nations and in civil society, and working all over the world, in Africa, Asia, Latin America, and Europe. You have the floor, Mike. Thank you. Thank you very much, Laura. And my career actually started working with refugees and internally displaced persons, so I feel very strongly about this topic. And I think the Global Fund might be one of those non-traditional partners that Ola was talking about. Because I think for many people, the Global Fund is not traditionally an organization you would think of when thinking about uh, programs addressing the needs of migrant and refugee populations. But in a world that as increasingly confronted with conflict and economic crisis and the largest refugee crisis in modern history. The Global Fund, in the, re in the, the current strategy, we are prioritizing challenging operating environments to ensure uninterrupted provision of HIV, TB and malaria interventions to people in need. Challenging operating environments amount for one quarter of the global disease burden for HIV, TB and malaria. And uh, related to that, for one quarter of global fund investment, which amounts to approximately $1 billion a year. The global fund approach to challenging operating environments is based on the principles of flexibility, innovation, and adaptive approaches and partnerships with traditional partners and emergency responders. And one interesting feature of this policy is that country allocations are intended to serve the needs of people, not of countries. So as people are crossing borders and are on the move, we have the flexibility to shift funding to the host country to enhance continuity of services. As of the end of 2017, there were 68.5 million, uh, million forcibly displaced people worldwide, refugees, migrants, and internally displaced persons. And more than 44,000 people flee their homes every day due to conflict and persecution. The number of international migrants worldwide has continued to grow rapidly in recent years, reaching 258 58 million in 2017, up from 220 million in 2010, and 173 million in 2000. The Global Compact addresses the need for a common approach to inter international migration. A success successful compact cannot be complete without support for the vision of the 2030 Sustainable Development Goals, leaving no one behind in the right to health for all. Many migrants still lack access to health services, prevention and protection due to their migration status. Preventable diseases like HIV, TB and malaria strain health systems that are already overburdened due to conflict, disaster or extreme poverty, leaving fewer resources to provide basic health services or to prepare for emergency health threats, as we've seen with Ebola in uh, Western Africa and more recently in DRC. The best way to improve health and prevent new diseases from spreading is to meet the needs of the most vulnerable populations, especially those forced to flee their homes and cross national borders. With the introduction of the policy in uh, challenging operating environments, the Global Fund has increasingly engaged with partners whose mandates address the needs of mobile populations at a more strategic and operational level. Beyond collaborating on grant implementation, the Global Fund is committed to identifying durable and sustainable solutions for these populations by integrating their health needs into the Global Fund model and by building capacity in host countries. This entails establishing stronger communications across agencies like IOM and UNHCR at headquarter level, but also to facilitate communication in country to better account for migrant needs. Taking these aspects into account and adapting a traditional development model contributes to bridging the humanitarian development divide and to further positioning the Global Fund in addressing health issues in migrant populations. I would like to highlight a few concrete examples. In Uganda, the government led a multi-party discussion to identify gaps in HIV, TB and malaria services for refugees from uh, South Sudan and DRC, with strong participation from UNHCR and the Global Fund. An emergency grant was approved to respond to the malaria gap for the refugee population. IOM contributes to the implementation of a multi-country grant for TB and multi-resistant TB interventions among Afghan refugees, returnees, mobile populations in Afghanistan, Iran and Pakistan. 
Funding is available through country allocations, multi-country programs, and or from the emergency fund. The best practice for more effective resource management is that of the Middle East response grant. This was initially an emergency fund grant, and it transitioned into a regional grant encompassing Syria, Jordan, Lebanon, Palestine, Iraq, and Yemen. With IOM as a principal recipient, the grant is managed from a centralized unit in Amman. The regional approach ensures that funding follows people across borders and allows for information sharing across countries and for capacity building. <coughs> so it, it, it's working with all these countries that are affected by similar issues due to the hosting of large number of uh, migrants. In closing, IOM, UNHCR and other players in, uh, that are dealing with migrant and refugee uh, populations, they're important partners for the Global Fund as implemented par uh, implementers of programs. But they have the collaboration goes beyond the implementation of programs. We are very keen to bring this partnership to the next level, be more strategic, <coughs> as population movement is here to stay. So we would like to work with IOM, UNHCR and other partners to work towards more sustainable responses and capacity building as we're dealing with migrant and refugee populations. Thank you. Thank you very much. And certainly the, the relationship between IOM and the Global Fund has increased substantially, I think, in the last years and has shown that uh, we have a lot of ways of working together that are much better than working separately. Yes. So I think that's a, a very good example. And I, I, I think that your funding uh, models are quite interesting and could be also eventually a, an example of how to do things uh, with, within the Global Compact implementation. So thank you very much. And I appreciate even more that you came with uh, your, your leg with a problem. But, uh, so let me move to the last speaker on the panel, that is uh, Ms. Melissa Pitotti. Uh, Melissa uh, is the Director of Policy of the International Council of Voluntary Agencies, MIC, uh, ICPA. Melissa is responsible for overseeing ICPA's engagement and positioning, particularly in relation to forced displacement and humanitarian financing. She works closely with the ICVA membership to provide analysis and guidance on key humanitarian issues and promoting joint advocacy for improved policies on protection, assistance, and durable solutions. It's a pleasure to have you here. Too. Uh, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. As the last speaker in the last substance session, I hope you permit me to have a bit of fun with my presentation. I'll be speaking to you from the future. So greetings from the future. Um, it's October 9th, 2030, to be exact. Uh, apologies if my signal gets cut. Uh, you see, I'm not really here in person. Um, to avoid carbon emissions from business travel, we've been using virtual conferencing systems for these kind of meetings. The added benefit of virtual meetings is that people from around the world can participate, even if they can't necessarily get a visa or if they don't have travel money. That means migrants, diaspora groups, affected municipalities, local and international NGOs, journalists, trade union representatives, development banks, corporate sponsors, and others, as I speak, are introducing themselves in the chat box and as they input their information in different languages, it's being simultaneously translated so that everyone can begin to react and complement my presentation. So how did we get here? Uh, do you remember on October 8th, 2018, when we attended the IOM IDM? The participants sitting next to me, they were buzzing because scientists had just issued their final call to save the world from climate catastrophe. They gave us 12 years to do it. 12 years to make a system-wide transformation at a speed and at a scale that had no documented historic precedent. This required a paradigm shift. If you actually looked at the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Report, on global warming of 1.5 degrees Celsius. It said many things that were relevant to the work we were doing at that same time to develop safe, orderly, and regular migration. 
On climate change, it was talking about increasing investments in physical and social infrastructure. It was talking about addressing barriers, including the scale of available financing and a limited access to available financing. And it talked about cooperation. And this kind of cooperation that was required included cooperation with non-state actors, including civil society industry, scientific institutions, and others. It required innovative financing, and it required uh, approaches that uh, ensured participation, transparency, capacity building, and learning among different players. So we took that urgency from 2018, the need for investment, the need for overcoming barriers, the need for inclusive cooperation, and we applied it to our own work uh, to meet the funding needs and have the capacity to support safe, orderly, and regular migration. We already had planned a capacity building mechanism. We had planned to support the UN, members, UN member states to implement the Global Compact. We had planned for a connection hub, for a startup fund, for an open source global knowledge platform. We had planned on supporting investments in IOM, on this UN network for migration, we were promoting the grand bargain commitments to reduce earmarking and multi-year financing, but we decided we need to go even further. First of all, we decided not to call it capacity building or capacity development or capacity strengthening. We decided to call it capacity sharing. This is because we recognize, particularly in conversations we were having at the time on localization and on the humanitarian development peace nexus, that we all have valuable experiences, valuable expertise, and capacities to offer. It wasn't about having a one-way learning experience. We needed peer-to-peer -peer exchange on a massive scale. And having this nuance of focusing on sharing helped build ownership because everyone was valued and could contribute. And we built on existing platforms that we heard about earlier today and yesterday. Uh, Laura, you said 12 years ago, this was not about just financial support, it was about expertise, and we wanted to harness that. The second point was institutional strengthening. When we reviewed the self-reports from the grand bargain, we realized that the grand bargain signatories hadn't yet fulfilled their commitment to, quote, increase and support multi-year investment in the institutional capacities of local and national responders. This included through, in quote, collaboration with development partners and incorporating capacity strengthening in partnership agreements. So in 2018, we took the decision to ask the grand bargain eminent person, who at the time was a CEO of the World Bank, will you please help us come up with collective approaches harnessing the grand bargain commitments for things like sustained twinning, immersive experiences, simulations, inculcated with a heavy emphasis on protection, on human rights, on international law and humanitarian principles. What we did is we mapped out all of the available capacities. We took an inventory, if you like, and we matched them to those who wanted it, who needed it, who demanded it. We connected them and we supported mass cross-learning. We invested in partners, including NGOs, who wanted to better run their organizations. This included better running through strategic planning, through foresight, through futures thinking, better financial and human resource management, more successful fundraising approaches, more dedicated preparedness, and we invested in how to build partnerships with diverse stakeholders. There's something to be said also about what we decided to do on storytelling. Recalling the Secretary General's Together campaign, we invested in migrants telling their own stories to young children in schools, in movies, in television, in radio, in houses of faith, in sports. We found that creating more opportunities for storytelling and connection chipped away at the toxic narrative re related to migrants and helped build political will. We also decided to deepen and widen the resource base. This is something that was a chapter, a specific chapter on the high-level panel on a humanitarian financing that was launched in 2016. 
For existing voluntary contributions, we did promote a reduced earmarking. We pr produced, promoted more core funding. Uh, we mapped out different instruments that were available at the global, the regional, and the country levels, and tried to explain these options better to those who could use them so that they were more accessible. For voluntary contributions, we encourage people to fix a percentage, maybe 2.5% in some cases, more in others, so that there's always a steady stream of funding going towards institution strengthening. The system-wide work was costed out and was funded by a variety of contributors through a variety of accessible channels, a mix of bilateral contributions, pooled funds, and other financing instruments. There had been talk of a startup fund and seed funding and voluntary contributions, but to get to the scale and predictability we needed, we needed to unlock new resources. So we decided, despite strong resistance, to push for solidarity levies. Solidarity levies created a steady revenue stream for this work. We were inspired by the Unitaid micro levy on airline tickets that raised 1.6 billion euros between 2006 and 2011 with a participation of only 10 countries. We also decided in 2018 to launch an interagency exchange. This exchange improved financial literacy. It built a practitioner community on topics like crowdfunding and Islamic social financing. The first exchange was held in Kuala Lumpur in November 2018 and we built from there. <clears throat> Another campaign that we launched, and it actually succeeded, was to achieve a reduction to less than 3% for transaction costs of migrant remittances. The campaign rewarded with visibility those money transfer agencies who lowered their commission rates and waived the fees. We knew there was no way to uh, actually influence the flow of remittance funding, but we were able to provide diaspora groups with some tips on how they could make their funding perhaps 10% more dedicated to collective action. And of course, we wouldn't have been complete without looking at measurements and accountability. The accumulated benefits of all these initiatives were demonstrated as we edged towards 2030 in terms of efficiencies, effectiveness, and quality. As each year passed, we collected data, evidence, and we showed that our investments were smart. We checked in on progress in 2022 and 2026 at the International Migration Review Forum. We told stories of our successes to inspire each other. And we decided that we also needed to address the issue of incentives. After my virtual presentation concludes, we're going to be presenting an award ceremony. You see, to reward good behavior that's supporting the public good, we decided to create a variety of incentives to uh, acknowledge those who share capacity, who plan ahead, and who help unlock new resources. We joined with prestigious companies and universities and celebrity to provide high profile awards to those good examples. And at the end of the year 2030, in December, we're going to have a big reunion. This reunion is going to bring together all those who participated in our variety of uh, capacity strengthening initiatives to come together, take stock of what they learned, and see how they can move forward together in the future. So I leave you now for my future perch to ask you three questions I did not answer in my retrospective. First, who do you think connected the dots? From climate change to migration to the sustainable development goals, from UN reform to the new way of working, and the grand bargain, the migration compact, the refugee compact, the World Bank's growing role, who actually connected these together and explained what resources are coming online in simple terms and provided support to those who want to take advantage of these opportunities? Second, who do you think minded the financial gap? By this I mean the significant funding shortfall. It's a task that's been made difficult because we live, continue to live in an environment where we compete for scarce resources in a challenging political climate. Third and finally, who do you think acted as a watchdog over these last 12 years? Who raised the flag when efforts were being used to build walls and detention centers rather than appropriate capacity mechanisms? To ensure that efforts to address migrants was done in dignity and in line with the rights-based approach. We talk about the three Ps, protection, principles, and partnership. This is what we like to make sure we keep an eye on going forward. So enjoy the rest of your event, signing off.
Thank you very much. That's a very optimistic uh, presentation because for, I would say for two reasons. First of all, because we did fi indeed find solutions uh, to the problem. And second, because we all look the same way 30 years later. <laughs> so I think that that's already something yes, extremely good. Yes, no? <laughs>